All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly, bringing you all the best JavaScript news of the week in a podcast form. This is episode 83, and uh, we got some pretty exciting stuff this week around, so let's get started. As usual, the first section we got is getting started with all the tutorials and introductions, and the first article we got here today is creating custom JavaScript syntax with Babel. <clears throat> Apologies. <laughs> Uh, so this one is uh, talking about creating your own custom uh, syntax for Babel. So not just, you know, plugins or whatever, but specifically the syntax, something that is actually pretty hard to pull off. So if you were curious do check this one out. So this one uh, specifically talks about adding double at symbol that turns any function you define it for into carried function. If that sounds interesting, do check it out. It's actually a very good write up on how to do that properly. How does the Babel uh, syntax parsing works and how do you can actually fork it and uh, turn it or make it parse your own custom stuff. Not that I would recommend doing that, but as a, you know, learning experience, this is actually pretty good. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next article we got here is the guide to learning React hooks, examples in tutorials. This is a very comprehensive guide that basically um, explains how React hooks works, how do you use them, why do you need them, and why you should migrate. Um, again, you know, if you're already using hooks, you won't really find anything new here. If you are still thinking about migrating from classes to hooks, then this is yet another one of pretty great articles um, outlining everything you need to know about hooks. Make sure to note the last section it has, the links and resources. They're a pretty great collection of uh, well, links and resources, as it says, uh, to everything hooks related. So if you are just getting started with hooks, do check this one out. It's actually a really good one. All right. Next thing we got here is an unintentionally comprehensive introduction to GitHub Actions. A pretty nice, uh, how to put it, decomposition, I guess, of a typical Node.js YAML file for GitHub Actions and line by line walkthrough of what exactly it does and how does it work. So if you are thinking about migrating to GitHub Actions and you weren't sure about the syntax and all the things that it has basically, do check this one out. It is actually a very good write-up and will get you started in no time. The next article we got here is let's write a BrainFuck compiler. So this is a tutorial on, as you might imagine, writing a BrainFuck compiler and it's a very low level on. So it's like it's a very simple one when you specifically tokenize and process the string, you know, char character by character on your own. So no, nothing fancy here. It's actually a really good write up on, you know, very, uh, let's, yeah, let, me, let me try this again. So it's a pretty good write up on uh, basics of compilers. Let's put it this way. Um, the basics of interpreters, I guess. Uh, yeah, I mean, BrainFuck is not exactly the most complicated language out there, but I think it's a very good starting point if you ever want to write your own compiler or interpreter. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Okay, next article we got here is don't use JavaScript variables without knowing temporal dead zone. So this is a pretty good explanation of what TDZ is and how does it affect your variables and your code. Um, you know, if you've been writing JavaScript for quite some time, you probably know what TDZ is, if, even if you never heard the specific term. I mean, the idea of it is quite straightforward. But if you're just getting started and, you know, if you've been uh, learning JavaScript and you're still not sure how does the variable get defined, how, do they, how, is, how are they hoisted, and what is the TDZ, then do give it a read. It's actually a very good write-up on a variety of cases where the TDZs apply and uh, when to basically what to keep in mind when defining variables. Um, essentially, majority of those cases actually can be called by a linter. Uh, so, you know, if you are coding and if you're seriously considering working with JavaScript, make sure you have ESLint installed and basic rules configured because they will save you a lot of pain. There we go. All right, the next article we got here is, I think, yeah, this is, yeah, this is still getting started. I'm, I'm a bit under weather today, so I apologize in advance if I'm a bit slow. But uh, there we go. So the next article we got here is getting started with Node GUI. This is the tutorial for Node GUI, which is um, Node.js based library, which is essentially a bindings for Qt, which is the C, C++ uh, UI component library. So essentially what this allows you to do is to write native UI desktop apps without like, you know, Electron, Chromium based or anything with Qt framework actually, which is 
Uh, pretty cool. Like again, you know, this kind of has the requirements of uh, making the user install the Qt itself, but then the binary of the app and the size, the memory footprint and so on and so forth will obviously be a lot better than the ones of the Electron app. And this article just walks you through setting up the dev environment, writing your basic Hello World app, and then using more fancy widgets uh, from Qt within your app to uh, build a password generator. So if you ever was, you know, had a use case where you need to build a native app that is not Electron for some reason, maybe you are working in a resource restricted environment and something like this, then this is actually a very good starting point. Uh, one interesting thing that I did not know about Qt is that actually it allows you to style your components using style sheets, or maybe this is the node Qt specifically. But I think I read somewhere that the Qt actually added this as a feature, which is, uh, Honestly, pretty cool. So yeah, again, if you're interested in desktop apps and for some reason don't like Electron and want something more efficient or you know, you're know you restricted by requirements, do check this one out. It actually is a pretty good write-up and pretty good introduction to a Node GUI. All right, next thing we got here is three amazing ways to generate random numbers without math random. A pretty nice deep dive into the variety of uh, pseudo random uh, generation methods, random number generation methods, uh, such as the uh, middle square methods, uh, which, you know, is probably something, I don't know, at least we had that in university. I remember learning about that. It's a very straightforward uh, seed-based method. Then you got the linear congruential generators, uh, something I think we briefly touched in, uni but like this is, you know, this is far away from what I typically do on a daily basis. So I don't remember half of that. And of course the XOR, uh, XOR shift algorithm, which is probably the, uh, most straightforward and easiest one out there. Um, yeah, so if you are interested in random number generation and wanted to learn about those algorithms, do check this one out. It's a pretty good write-up that explains how they work and how do you write them on your own in JavaScript. All right, next thing we got here is don't sync state derive it. A pretty nice write-up on uh, simplifying your state in React. So this is specifically talking about React and state description using hooks, right? So the example here is the, um, God damn it, I forgot the, I tend to forget the names of things in English and then it pops up in my head in German or Russian, tic-tac-toe game, right? So this talks specifically about tic-tac-toe game where you have a field of, uh, you know, three by three, so array of nine positions. And then uh, you need to basically set the squares specific for specific values. And then you need to define if there's a winner and what's the status of it, right? So the first example, the uh, Mr. Kansi Dodds gives here is that, okay, so we got this select square method that okay, if there's a winner, or if this square is already defined, you cannot do that. Otherwise, we're going to define a new value. And then we're going to immediately calculate the next value winner and status, right, and set all of that to the state. Now it all looks fine and it probably will work okay, but you know, as soon as you introduce a new function that says, okay, let's set two squares, you already get a problem, right? So you get this duplicate code that basically does the same. Of course, we can always extract that into the new function, but that is not exactly very nice, right? So there's, there's obviously better solution to this than that. Now the solution is actually super simple. So instead of, um, calculating the state and setting it every time you change the squares, because essentially this next value winner and status, they are derived, right, from the previous values. So you don't actually have to memoize them. You don't have to remember them, right? All you have to do is just derive them from squares every time the function runs. And that works magically. Like you literally only have to update the state in for squares, and then you just basically derive it every time the function runs. Obviously, this might have some performance implications. Uh, again, you know, introducing the function that updates two squares is just as easy because you literally just do the same, but with two values. Now, the interesting thing is like, yes, this works with all the hooks, reducer and derived props and whatever. So the performance is one of the, pro it might be the problem. Now, here's the cool thing is that majority of time, it won't even be the problem because in this case, it's like array of nine values is gonna be extremely fast. You don't even have to care about it. But if it does become a problem, you can just use React, use memo hook to just memoize the calculation based on uh, squares definition, right? So it's very, very straightforward and very uh, simple. 
So if the, if the idea of the article sounds interesting, do check it out. It's actually a really good write-up on simplifying your state and something that is, I would say, pretty good to learn if you are, um, well, I guess, I guess not just getting started with hooks, but migrating to the hooks as well, because there is a lot of cases where you can simplify your state just by doing that. All right. Um, next article we got here is working with Node.js on Hyper-V and VSL2. This is a pretty interesting comparison between the uh, running Node.js within the Hyper-V virtual machine on Windows 10 and within the VSL2, which is for now just on Windows Insiders and not exactly production ready, but you know, it exists and uh, it's an interesting comparison. So it compares how do you actually install, configure everything and then how do you work with it. Uh, there are some dubious points here that I'm not sure I, you know, I would actually even go as, as far as to compare. Uh, but there is some interesting details in here. So for example, the difference in, in performance is actually not that, um, not that big, at, at least for the image comparison, which happens within each VM, right? So we got the Hyper-V does it in 62 seconds and VSL2 does it in 59 seconds, which gives you like three seconds performance difference, which is, not too much, so you know, 5%, it's okay. Uh, but nonetheless, it's a pretty interesting comparison. So if you're using Windows 10 and you are looking into VSL2, make sure to check this one out. I probably actually, with all the problems I've gotten from the VSL1, I'm thinking maybe I should just use Hyper-V and install Ubuntu in there to work within Ubuntu because it seems like it's just gonna be less problems. And with the remote, um, remote visual code thing, it probably, I have to try that. It actually sounds a lot more interesting than, you know, working with VSL1 that just freaks out from time to time. But uh, we'll see, maybe VSL2 comes out faster than that. <laughs> so there you go. Okay, and the last article we got here for today in the getting started section is fixing layout instability. So this is, um, there's actually a two kind of two post part, uh, God damn it, two part posts about layout instability. The idea that, you know, when you render the page, something suddenly shifts when the data is loaded or the CSS is added or whatever, you, you probably know exactly the problem, you know, when you open the mobile website and then content starts jumping all over the place because the image is loaded or whatever, which is completely infuriating. And if this is, um, this applies to advertisement, it can be even harmful basically because you can misclick on a thing that is ad, right? So you don't want this to happen. And this article talks about specifically fixing the layout instability. So how to address this, how to figure out where, when exactly it happens, why exactly it happens and how to address it, how to make it not jump essentially uh, using, uh, so there's this uh, tool that is called web page test from Google. And this is exactly what the author here uses to make this work, which is actually very helpful. So if you're working with stuff like this, do check it out. This might be a very handy thing to do. All right, that is it for the getting started section. Now we're coming to the articles and news. The first article we got here today is evaluating JavaScript code via import statement. Yes, that's the thing. And this is something that you apparently can do. So uh, obviously there is this uh, Realms proposal that we have in works. I don't even know what stage is it now. I think it's like stage two right now. Okay, so it's actually progressing quite nicely. So the Realms API is basically the better eval with some security and uh, module support that is coming in next year, I guess. Uh, maybe longer depending on how the spec progresses. But uh, you know, so now we have eval for uh, evaluating the code dynamically but it doesn't support in import and export, right? So the thing is that you can actually import or evaluate the code using import by appending that code as a dot, as constructing the imported URL as a data URI, right? So you just say, okay, so this is a data text JavaScript, char set UDF8, and then you append your uh, URL encoded JavaScript and then you just import that. And that works as basically eval that can uh, import other statements, export default values, and so on and so forth. Um, the neat thing is that the um, Dr. Rauschmeier here also creates the tag template literal that allows you to easily create this data URIs by prepending the ESM tag template. But not just that, it also allows you to import from other tag templates and construct kind of a bundle in this way, which is 
kind of amusing, to be honest. So, you know, it's a pretty neat write-up. Um, it's not that long, but it's a very interesting um, idea. That sounds interesting, do check it out. There's a bit more technical details on how exactly that works, uh, but I found it to be pretty fascinating, to be honest. All right, next thing we got here is Mario Kart CSS, interactive Mario Kart with only CSS. And uh, yep, that's uh, zero images, zero lines of JavaScript, 100% CSS, and well, there's some HTML obviously to make it work, but um, it yeah, it's Mario Kart with CSS. It's interactive, it works, and it's pure CSS. Even even have a character selection. Just just think about that for a second. Like, <laughs> if you are curious how that was made, there is basically a write up that describes all the stuff, including the animations, key bindings, toggle menus, and all that kind of stuff. It is insane. I am still terrified of CSS, but yes, it works. Yes, you can do it, and it is fascinating. All right, that is it for the articles and news. Now we're coming to the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness uh, section. The first announcement we got here today is the Mozilla developer uh, is now a YouTube channel, and they're going to be basically posting a bunch of uh, Mozilla developer, blah, blah, blah. let me try that again. Mozilla developer network content on there. So if you are uh, curious about their stuff, if you uh, like the Mozilla content, and you know, it typically is very, very good, very, um, I mean, okay, the, I wouldn't say high level because sometimes they have very <laughs> in depth articles and stuff like this. But yeah, it's, it's Mozilla developer network. It's likely going to be very high quality very good content. So if that sounds interesting, do go ahead and subscribe. They already have like a bunch of stuff uh, here specifically for uh, Dev Chrome, like Firefox Dev Tools, uh, specifically for stuff like CSS, dark modes, and so on and so forth. Seems promising. So if that sounds interesting, do make sure to subscribe. Next thing we got here is the way to audit the runtime performance of your ESLint rules. So this is a thing I didn't know existed. Basically, you can pass a timing equal one n variable before running ESLint to get a table of timings based on an ESLint rule that is executed during the lint run, right? Which is um, actually pretty damn cool. So if you are working with ESLint and you are working on a super large code base and something feels slow, now you can find out which rule exactly feels slow and uh, maybe optimize it, do a pull request or something. This is actually seems extremely handy. All right, next thing we got here is the announcement. So there was a TC39 meeting and there's a bunch of uh, ECMAScript proposals moving stages. This one is probably the most exciting for me. So we got the records and tuples proposal, which is the immutable data structures. I think they renamed it at, at one point. Yeah, it was const value types. Uh, is now stage one, which is great because it's no longer stage zero. So it's not just you know, basically a suggestion. Now it's actually a draft and work in progress. And now it's called records and tuples. So we got the records and tuples, but they are immutable data structures and they are coming to JavaScript. I really hope it's gonna be very fast uh, because this is extremely exciting. I absolutely love working with immutable data structures. I think they make your life a lot easier than, uh, you know, typical mutable structures that you have everywhere. Um, and yeah, I'm just, quite excited about that. So let's see how that develops. And uh, the next change we got here is global. This is now stage four, which basically means it's done. It's finished. It's going to be probably shipped in ES 2020, but uh, we're going to see about that. Uh, but yeah, you know, I mean, it's already shipped in Chrome and I guess now that it's stage four, we're going to see it in Firefox, Safari, and all the other browsers basically. Right, so next thing we got here is uh, running Vasi in JavaScript with Vasmer.js. So the Vasmer.js guys who build this Vasmer standalone uh, WebAssembly engine are bringing WebAssembly system interfaces to Node.js using their own engine, right? So you can, uh, like obviously at one point we're gonna get Vasi in Node.js natively, but for now there's other ways of running it and Vasmer is now one of them. So you can literally do that from Node.js. You can just import a WebAssembly module that is compiled for Vasi and use it within Node.js without any additional things. It is, honestly looks like magic. So, you know, if you were interested in that, do check it out. My cat is also, I don't know, can you see her? Yeah, you can see her ears. So my cat decided to occupy my uh, face for some reason. 
But there we go. Okay, so yeah, again, if you're interested in WebAssembly, do check this one out. It is um, actually pretty damn cool. Right, the next thing we got here is announcement from OpenJS Foundation. So they got the first um, incubated project. So they accepted the first incubating project, uh, which is gonna be Node Version Manager, uh, which is great news to community. So I'm guessing it's basically gonna get some support from the OpenJS Foundation site, maybe some funding, and uh, we're gonna see more active development within it, which is always great. I personally use NVM, well, not exactly daily, but at least weekly for a bunch of things. And it's a great little project. So yes, quite quite excited to see that basically. All right, next thing we got here is the full ICU support was added to Node.js. So ICU in this case, meaning not intensive care unit the uh, international components for Unicode. So you can now actually use any and all Unicode characters within Node.js without any third party modules or you know tweaks needed to it essentially, which is uh, kind of great. So obviously there's a trade off in terms of uh, the node binary size because the um, full ICU, you know, there's a lot more Unicode characters. So you got to increase the binary size by a few megabytes, I mean, initially they talked about the uh, from, you know, increase from 35 megs to 49 megs, which is quite significant, but I believe the final result is quite much more uh, conservative because of the better compression. So um, yeah, there you go. That's pretty great. So, you know, if you're working with Unicode stuff, I guess that's exciting news for you. All right. Next thing we got here is why npm log files can be a security blind spot for injecting malicious modules. A pretty nice write up from the snake guys uh, talking about the importance of validating your um, log files, especially if you are a public project that accepts pull requests and the ways to do that in a simple way, you know, with using, for example, uh, npx log file lint or a uh, bunch of other tools. So if you're maintaining project and you care about security, do check this one out. It's very easy to set up and just, you know, a little something to keep in mind, basically. Okay, continuing, we got, um, yes, finally, iOS 13 supports Visual Viewport API that finally allow you to detect a proper view visible area to the user whenever the keyboard is expanded. I am kind of, you know, baffled that it wasn't supported before that, but uh, Yes, Safari on iOS is a bit of a pain in the ass. So there you go. All right, and I think the last thing we got here in the tips and tricks and bit-sized awesomeness is the fact that Vue.js version three is now open source. So there is still like, you know, docs are in progress and the work in pro like the whole thing is work in progress essentially. It's an alpha version or even pre-alpha version. But uh, yeah, it's now open source. You can have a look at it. You can basically check out the packages, check out the examples, check out the tests, see how Vue.js version three will work. What does it have to offer and so on and so forth. Again, you know, expect that there is gonna be changes. It's pre-alpha, there's still work in progress. It's probably lack of documentation, but that's your chance to help. So if you like Vue.js, do check it out. Right, that is it for the tips, tricks, and bit-sized awesomeness. Now we're coming to the releases section. And the first big release of the week we got here is Preact X or Preact 10, I guess, uh, that ships with a ton of things, including support for fragments. So you can now use React fragments within Preact. Uh, it now has component did catch support, uh, it has hooks support, test utils, add-on, create context API, Compat is now part of the core. So once you use Preact X, it's now gonna be completely compatible with uh, React uh, libraries basically, right? So I assume you can just basically use it as a drop-in replacement where you care more about the size rather than performance in you know heavy load cases, which is uh, pretty damn awesome to be honest. And um, it's the same three kilobyte size, which is how are they managed to do that, which is just mind blowing. So yes, there you go. Um, if yeah, if, if that sounds interesting, do check out Preact is a super nice tiny library. And uh, well, it's yeah fully compatible with React, which is just mind blowing. Right, next release we got here is WebHint browser extension is now version one. So you can grab it for Chrome, Edge, Chromium and Firefox. And if you never heard about it, I think we talked about it three or four times on this podcast is basically sort of like Lighthouse audits, but more diverse in terms of, you know, there's like accessibility, compatibility, performance, common fitfalls, uh, progressive web apps and security 
uh, comments and then they also allow you to uh, do the tips against specific set of browsers. You can say, okay, so we're gonna roll any browsers that is 0.5%, last two versions, Firefox, ESR, and not that. Or you can specify your own list, which is pretty damn handy. So if you are running a major browser that needs to, you know, basically has some standards, do check this out. This could be immensely useful. All right. Next release we got here is Node Red version one. So they are finally, <clears throat> apologies, version one and stable. Uh, if you never heard about Node Red, it's um, sort of flow based, visual based programming uh, language, I guess, programming editor um, that is based on Node.js and allows you to build apps by just dragging and dropping components. I've heard good things about it. I never tried it myself, but um, now that it's version one, maybe I should. It actually seems pretty powerful and pretty nice to use. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out. Next thing we got here is TypeScript version 3.7 beta. Now, um, this might make me try TypeScript because it has optional chaining, nullish coalescence and assertion functions all in one. And this is like optional chaining and nullish coalescence is something that I've been uh, waiting in, in native JavaScript for ages. Like, I mean, it's, it's you know, it's kind of almost there, but we still don't have it in Node. We still don't have it in Chrome. And now I can just use TypeScript and get, like this might make me try TypeScript again, because honestly, those features are really handy in some cases. And yes, I mean, it's still beta, but you know, the TypeScript betas tend to be pretty stable. So there you go. All right. And the last thing we got here for today is uh, in the releases section is Next.js version 907. Now, the reason why I am highlighting 907, the patch version is uh, because of the two things. The first one, there is now gzip compression that is enabled by default. And the cool thing that it was actually contributed by Google employees, which is uh, pretty damn impressive to be honest. And the second is basically PSA, the starting from the Next.js version 907, Next.js will contain telemetry that is enabled by default. So you basically have to keep that in mind if you're working in a company that is telemetry sensitive. I mean, they're just collecting the usage statistics so it's nothing, you know, criminal or whatever. Uh, and yeah, there's obviously an opt out and everything. Um, they have actually a pretty good page uh, describing what they collect, how do they collect it, and how do you opt out? So yeah, um, just keep that in mind basically. All right, that is it for the releases. Uh, hey, Donna, welcome to the stream. Thank you very much for your support as usual. Thank you for your donation and for your uh, subscription. That is really awesome. All right, uh, continuing, we got libraries and demo section. And the first library we got here is, or I guess command line tool is cottage. Cottage. I guess it's cottage, right? Because it's cut to image. So the idea is that you can actually uh, generate a super nice, fancy looking images of your uh, scripts with outputs by just running the cottage command, which is um, actually seems pretty handy. So essentially you can just run a cottage against your code and get a nice screenshot of the code itself and what the execution will result in. So if you're um, you know, making a lot of samples of some code, do check it out. Uh, it is actually looking pretty nice. All right, next thing we got here is Pipoca, 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 J some of those names are just insanely hard to read. You know, it's going to go with Pipoca JS, all in one web framework that uh, includes the responsive front end and serverless backend. Uh, you like, yeah, it's based on React, MobX, Node.js, Postgres, Amazon Web Services, GitLab, and uh, Braintree. Seems quite nice. Like, I don't know if I buy the whole serverless thing. Uh, why are you, I, what is happening? There we go. Um, yeah, it looks very nice. It has like a bunch of widgets. There's this uh, demo UI that basically allows you to customize it in real time with, you know, the whole like tweaks and things. And it looks pretty nice, at least the front end part. So I don't know about the serverless part of it, but um, yeah, it's like the wizards and everything. And he even has the kiosk mode. So if you're interested, uh, looks pretty cool. So if that sounds like your cup of tea, do check it out. All right, next demo we got here is bundle analyzer. Um, I found this pretty interesting. Like this is not open source tool as far as I can tell, but it is free for now. And uh, it seems to be 
pretty neat. So the idea is that essentially you can run it on top of your GitHub repo, right? And it will analyze your bundles and put out the statistics and show you the kind of the split of your um, split of your JavaScript and CSS over the builds, over the history, over each commit, which is uh, pretty damn cool. So if you're you know, if you care about the sizes and if you care about the bundles and want to analyze it more in depth, do check it out. This might be exactly what you were looking for. Okay. Next thing we got here is React 3 Fiber, a React renderer for 3.js that works in web and React Native, which is actually pretty cool. And that basically allows you to declaratively, blah, 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 let me try that again, declaratively render 3.js scenes and 3.js objects using React. So um, yeah, it's, it's basically this. You can literally construct meshes and using React tags and then just render it into 3.js canvas. And uh, it also works on React Native, which is kind of crazy. So I guess if you're working with 3D and or if you maybe were looking to working in 3D with React, do check it out. I mean, there's like a bunch of demos here and they're available all on Code Sandbox and you can try them out yourself. It looks pretty cool. What is happening? Why is my... Okay, this works, but why can I... Uh, okay, you know what? Whatever. <laughs> Not even going to try that right now. But yeah, there's like a bunch of demos, bunch of examples. Uh, looks really impressive. So if you're interested in marrying, I guess, 3.js and React Renderer, then do check it out. It seems to be pretty damn cool. Next thing we got here is Delatin um, or Delat. I'm not sure. I guess Delatin, right? Because it's Delaney Triangulation. Uh, so this is a fast JavaScript terrain mesh generation tool based on Delaney triangulation. And yeah, it's basically terrain generation. Uh, it looks pretty fancy. So really fast, very performant. I, I don't know if you want to generate terrain, then I guess look at this. I'm honestly not sure what the use cases would be. So it seems like it generates the terrains from specific geometry, like Yosemite Canyon and stuff like this, which I you know what? That's like far away from my area of expertise. I have no idea why would you need that. But if you know why, then do check it out. It's from the map box, guys. So I assume it's uh, it's good, right? Um, yes, Kat. She's for some reason decided to sit in front of my face today and just stare at my monitor. I don't know. Okay. Continuing, we got at databases, a TypeScript client for databases that prevents uh, SQL injection. So specifically build with SQL injection prevention in mind. And it's a very simple SQL client. So it, it's not an ORM. It's not, you know, anything like that. It's just basically SQL client that allows you to query your SQL database by just uh, wrapping your query in the template literal tag that is supposed to prevent you from SQL injections, which is actually sounds like a pretty neat idea. So it's a very thin wrapper around SQL queries and it might be extremely helpful. So if that sounds interesting, do check it out because it's, yeah, it literally seems like the easiest way to stop SQL injections, right? Okay, continuing, we got Node OIDC provider. So this is OpenID certified TM Oath to authorization server implementation in Node.js. So if you wanted, uh, you know, OpenID Connect compatible Oath to server, then well, check this one out. It seems to conform to all the standards. It's also sponsored by Oath Zero people, which means it's probably really good. So yeah, if you're working with Oath and OpenID, do check it out. This might be exactly what you were looking for. And uh, the license is MIT, if I remember correctly. I might be wrong. Yes, it is MIT, so there you go. It's even MIT license, so all is awesome. All right, next thing we got here is ship.js from Algolia folks. This is a um, tool to automate your releases. So the idea is that, you know, typically when you release package, you have to go manually into package.json, you have to update the change log, change the version, then actually build it and release it, and then publish a tag on GitHub, which can be annoying. I mean, there's like a bunch of different ways to doing that. But uh, ship.js basically aims to automate it for you. So you have the ship prepare command that does all the, you know, chores like bumping the version, generating change log, pushing it to GitHub, creating a tag and all that stuff for you. And then you create a pull request, you review it. And once you're happy with it, you just run ship.js trigger, which would actually do the real work of testing it, publishing to NPM and creating a git tag uh, for the thing. 
I think like the ship.js itself is new, but I think it's not, you know, the only tool out there that does this. I think there's like a lot of tries to do that. I personally didn't like any of them. Like I tried a bunch of them, but it never kind of aligned with how I do releases. <laughs> and this neither, you know, the ship just doesn't look either like this. So, uh, but you know, maybe you do it in similar ma manner. So do check it out if that sounds interesting. It actually looks quite solid, right? So it just doesn't align with what I do. All right. Next thing we got here is React Use Animations, the library with a very confusing name. I thought initially it was hooks, but uh, it actually is just like a bunch of um, animations, pre-baked animations for React, like, you know, the activities, alert circles, button presses. Uh, for some reason, the examples are not integrated into the page, but rather served as a code sandbox. Looks like this, so you click on thing and then there's some animation happens. The animations are really nice looking. So, you know, if you were, um, if you are working with stuff like this and you wanted animation, okay, some of them actually work here, but not all the time, which is a bit weird, but there you go. Yeah. So if you were looking for nice little animations for your React app, do check it out. This seems to be quite nice. All right. Next thing we got here is React Timekeeper, Google Keep Inspired Time Picker for React. So this is uh, pretty much default Android time picker, I guess, you know, when you have the two circles and you can drag stuff around and select the hours first, and then you select the minutes next. Uh, this works perfectly fine on the touch interfaces, but this is not very nice to use on desktop. So this is a lot better. And the fact that it combines both is kind of okay. But uh, I mean, yeah, I guess if you were working on a mobile app, this is kind of what, what you would want. Not sure you would really want that on desktop, but uh, you know, maybe you do, so do check it out. All right, next thing we got here is React Native Indicators, a set of activity indicators for React Native. Uh, those seems to be ported from the loader CSS, which is a very nice set of indicators. And this is basically just the same, but for React Native. So if you're building a React Native app and you needed a loading indicator, do check this one out. They seem to look quite nice. So uh, yeah, that's basically it for it, right? And the last thing we got here today in the libraries and demos is a head repo, a pretty nice collection of, uh, so it's a list of everything that could go in head of your HTML document, right? There's even a website that is basically, um, has it in formatted manner. So if you're building a website and you are curious, what can you put in the head tag, then well, this repo has everything you could ever put in there, which is, mind-blowingly a lot. Uh, obviously, you don't have to do all of that stuff, right? But it's a very nice reference, especially for stuff like, you know, Facebook Open Graph, Twitter Cards, Schema Org, and things like this. Uh, so yeah, it's a very nice reference, basically. Right, that is it for libraries and demos. Before we wrap this up here, I got one more thing to show you. It's a tiny game called Bot Lens. Um, I'm actually currently logged in. Let me open it in new incognito window. Um, so it's, um, and it doesn't say what it is. Okay. <laughs> it's a programming game, uh, where you basically program your bots to fight other players and you can either attack or defend when you build defenses, you essentially have your core processors that you have to protect <clears throat> and then you can program and place bots that will protect it. The cool thing is that you have the pre-made bots that basically just do something stupid. And then you have an option to actually edit the script. Uh, I don't actually have any, so, you know. So you actually uh, use this, um, I forgot the name of it. I think it's Blockly or something, right? The language was essentially the uh, blocks. And you also got like pre-made scripts and everything. So you can actually pull them out and configure your bots. Scratch, they, they, thank you very much. This is exactly what the language is called. Uh, yeah, so you can like program your bots, make them scripts for them, test them out and make them fight other players, which is um, actually pretty fun. Not just that, but in addition, how the hell do I exit out of here? Where is my um, go back, discard changes and exit? There you go. Uh, but in addition to like having the ranked stuff, there is also a campaign somewhere. Where's my campaign? I remember. Um, is it not? I, there's like, you get the tutorial first that you have to go through, right? And then there's some like missions. Is that like daily challenge or something? But basically there's not just, you know, human wars if you are not that interested in fighting other people, but just interested in uh, solving puzzles. There is stuff like this. 
I am not sure where you'd go, but there was like a lot more. Um, okay, so I haven't finished all the tutorials yet, but there you go. Like basically, okay, if you're if if programming bots and making them fight each other sounds interesting and you can do that right in a browser and it's free, no ads or anything like that, do check it out. It's actually really cool and uh, yeah, seems pretty nice. Right, um, that's actually it from my side. So this was BXGS Weekly episode 83. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to throw them into the Twitch chat right now. If not, then that's basically it. As usual, you can find all the mentioned links on the GitHub under building X with JS uh, BXGS Weekly or on bxgs.dev website. Um, we also have a Discord server that you can join and talk about JavaScript and video games uh, because that's what we do there. Um, other than that, there is a Telegram channel where I post unfiltered links that I collect over the week for the podcast. There is my Twitter where I shit post about JavaScript and uh, that's basically it. So I think that's, yeah, this doesn't seem like there's any questions. That's basically from my side. So uh, next week I am planning to do a dev stream where we're going to rebuild the BXJS dev website from Next.js to Gatsby.js because I think the static way of uh, working with it would be a lot better. Basically, I will explain my reasoning on the stream. Uh, but yeah, I think it's going to be quite fun. So if that sounds interesting, do follow and subscribe and whatever. Um, yeah, and you know, if you missed it, VOD will be available immediately on Twitch or in a few hours on YouTube as usual. Right. Um, thank you guys very much for watching. Thank you for your continued support. Have an awesome rest of the weekend or if you're watching a VOD rest of the week. And I see you next time. Bye.